Hello, folks. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I'm your host for the evening, the Gritty Broman. Brian's out on his last hunt for the year. It's a late season mule deer hunt. Uh, if you guys haven't been following, go check it out on Instagram. Brian's been adding it to his story a couple times a day. This podcast is with Kevin Tim, owner of Seek Outside and one of his employees, Dennis Poyer. Uh, for those listening, at the end of this podcast is a tour Brian did of the Seek Outside headquarters. If you want to watch it, you can go to our YouTube channel and the video will be posted separately from this podcast video. Uh, this podcast, they kind of talk about what's new with Seek Outside, some of the new gear that's coming out. They got some cool stuff going on with their stoves. Uh, it's a good one. And remember, you guys can get free shipping at Mountain Ops, punch in the code GRITTY at checkout. And you guys can get 10% off the healthiest backcountry food out there. Use code GRITTY at Heather's Choice. And if you guys don't have any more hunts for the rest of the year, keep in mind that pack of runes make excellent stocking stuffers. And finally, guys, get 15% off Big Sissy Gear. Go ahead and get yourself a pair of the best trekking poles out there. And with that, let's get to the show. Welcome, folks, to the Gritty Podcast. I am here in Grand Junction, and I've got Kevin Tim with me, the man with two first names, and the owner of Seek Outside. What's up, Brian? How are you? I'm good. I'm real good. And we got Dennis Peroy, <laughs> or Perrier. You, you botched it. <laughs> poor, 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 Poyer. Poyer. That's Poyer what I said. How, That's how, what we, I said. how we pronounce it, yeah. <laughs> poy, Poyer. Poyer. But it's also pronounced or, or poy, Poyer. 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 Very, very French. Very French. French Canadian, yeah. Uh, and we're we're basically in Grand Junction at the Seek Outside headquarters, uh, factory, mm-hmm. manufacturing, Produ- production, production. Yeah, it's also a retail <coughs> area, although it's not like a full storefront. You yeah, know, but yeah, people We've got this come. little space over here where people can set up tents, uh, mess around with backpacks, yep, load up backpacks, do it all. all that stuff. So yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, we just finished a. Uh, a production, a tour of the facility here, mm-hmm. and it was very educational. So I recommend people check that out. I, I recommend you watch it, uh, not just listen to it, but it'll be available for for both. Uh, I'm looking at this mannequin here, and I see some lovely seek outside apparel. Yeah, yeah. Who did the uh, tent design with the moose antlers and hunt to eat? That was done in collaboration with Hunt to Eat. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. You need a shirt before you hit the road? Nice. I <laughs> would love that. Yeah, we'll, Hunt we'll to get eat. you up. Yeah. yeah. Same, same thing as on the hoodie here. So, Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Really kind of uh, supposed to depict a uh, hunt in the Brooks Range, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, wild territory, big wilderness kind of stuff. So Yeah. Yeah. It's well done. Patellus. It has that look to it, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yep. I like that artistry. So uh, I just finished hunting five, six days uh, here in Colorado. We were packed in pretty far. Mm-hmm. Brought the Cimarron with me and the medium stove, which has kind of been the go-to that I've used quite a, yeah. quite a bit lately. And uh, I like that medium. I, I had the larger stove, mm-hmm. which is the S- SXL. SXL. SXL, yeah. And uh, what's the S stand for? Um, you could... Um look at it two ways you could call it the short extra large or you could call it the uh small extra large, small, extra large yeah. <laughs> so, short. I, I call it short yeah, nice. short, yeah. Nice. It, it's really very similar to our extra large but it's two inches shorter which being two inches shorter allowed us to put the legs in a smaller diameter which saved more weight than you would just get from the two inches Mm -hmm. so it wasn't actually that hot we were talking about that um it's pretty mild temperatures out here this i mean it was in the 20s -hmm. uh but i didn't need to bring the bigger stove where i wished we had had it especially with the red the red cliff in Mm -hmm. um in muley country with lampers because it was negative five negative ten uh, out there and man, that bitter cold, you could feel it. And the red cliff is bigger than the Cimarron. We really needed a little bigger, bigger, uh, stove to really heat it. Well, nonetheless, it took the edge off. It was still warm. The bottom two feet, a foot and a half of the tent uh, was ice. So the Mm -hmm. edge from there to the bottom was completely ice. And then from the up from about foot and a half to two feet up, it was all dry as a bone. And so you could see where that stove wasn't quite 
pushing the heat all the yeah, way down. Yeah, it's still, it's still freezing down at ground level. Mm-hmm. You guys needed to be able to hang like a hammock person in there. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, well, if you're ever a little bit cold, you just sit up. Yeah. yeah. And then you're pretty warm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but the Cimarron, that, that stove... The medium sized stove seems perfect for the Cimarron, even in bitter cold. Like it's just that size that can really penetrate. Yeah, I would myself. I think the medium works well. I probably would have a tendency to go with the large SXL that, or the large U turn that you just saw. Um, Let's talk about that. Yeah. Mm. Oh. Yeah. And so we just did the 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 facility tour and we went in the office here. And I looked at this new U-turn st- stove that you that you that you've developed. Um, why did you develop it? And, and so, Dennis, describe it a little bit. What is it exactly? Yeah, so um, it, it's almost a throwback, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's something that we've made previously, or, or, or quite a while ago, um, and that was something that we're resurrecting almost. Um, and what we're able to do is we're able to use the same top, bottom, in the front. Um, we're going to ditch the sides and give you one continuous piece that wraps around. Um, and by ditching those sides and all those little bends and things that you got to get to make, to get it to fit together real nice and tight, we're, we're able to ditch a lot of weight, um, six, six to eight ounces and just losing the sides, um, and go into this one continuous piece. Uh, so, so basically on, I can take my existing stove. And I can get rid of the two sides and the back mm-hmm. and replace it with the new titanium U-turn material that you have developed and shed all the weight and all those connective pieces as well. Like every one of those is a seam mm-hmm. where I assume air and other things can, can, can get through. And here yeah. you are building it. So it just, it's all, it replaces those three sides. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Yeah, totally. So you're going to be able to get it both ways. Um, Our new U-turn, like the actual U-turn, is going to have a smaller diameter pipe with it as well. So the the damper is going to be two and a half inches versus our our old three and a quarter uh, or our standard, I guess, size, not old. We're not getting rid of the bigger stoves and and the box stoves. Um, But that two and a half inch is also going to save you, um, again, depending on how long a pipe you have sticking out, um, again, close to that six ounces. So... Um, four to six, again, just kind of depends on how long it is. Um, it saves you a significant amount of weight in that medium to large stove, which is going to be the two offerings we're going to have. If you already have, again, like Mm -hmm. you you already have a medium or a large stove, we're going to sell you that side. Um, so you, you could convert and save six to eight ounces. So my existing stove, let's say it's, uh, nearly two pounds. My medium. Let's call it two and a half. Okay, two. So two and a half pounds, and uh, I could probably with the new the new bag, the new stove, the new pipe, I can get that thing down. I can shave twelve ounces off of that Mm -hmm. existing weight. Mm -hmm. So you're pushing more like little over two pounds. Yeah, two pounds. You know, yeah, and I mean, it depends on which stuff That's, sack. And twelve ounces is a lot. I'm thinking of all the things I could bring <laughs> instead. <laughs> Almost another you know? day's worth of food. Yeah. Maybe maybe <laughs> a backup sleeping pad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, two thermal rests. <laughs> right. Definitely. Um, so that's a really cool, innovative product that you're coming out with. When will that be available? Um, Tuesday. Oh wow. So, so very couple, soon, a couple days, a couple days. I don't, we don't, I don't know when this will come out mm-hmm. necessarily, but, um, we're looking at November 12th, if that helps anybody um, yeah. uh, or Christmas for, you know, uh, those people looking for that. Uh, That's really cool. And then the other, another product that I looked at when I was here that really piques my interest is the Maddie Mc, Maddie McMadface, <laughs> Mc, Maddie McMadface <laughs> Mad ground <laughs> Yeah, you you know the story. Like, right? and I'm not. I'm gonna butcher the whole story. But the boat, uh-uh. uh, there was a boat. Uh, boy, I don't know if it was. Again, I'm not. I'm not getting getting gonna get all <laughs> I these. Think all somewhere these details. along the line, it was a Reddit thread somehow. <laughs> well, they they opened a, a vote up. Uh, like the British, somebody uh-huh. had a, a research vessel, and they wanted to name it, and so they opened it up. But they just let write-ins. Yeah, and so. Someone wrote in Bodie McBoatface, <laughs> uh-huh. and the masses voted that's that in. The name. Yeah, that's the name. So mm. that so it's a little play on that. Gotcha. Um, but our Facebook group had a lot of fun trying to name our Matt 
um, yep. which used to have a different name. Uh, Maddie McMatt, Mad Face or Matt Face? Matt Face. Matt so Matt uh, I, I, I'm not sure how many times we're going to go to the Facebook group and give them um, <laughs> capabilities to uh, name to a make product. A, make a choice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's yeah. a, it's a, would you say an EV? Yeah, quarter inch piece of EVA. Yeah, EVA foam. EVA, yeah. EVA yeah. foam. And yeah. I was mentioning how my pad went flat. My air pad went flat. Got a little like a couple of pin size holes because I fixed one after a day or two. I figured that where that hole was, there's still another one in there. Hmm. And you're up there in negative five degrees trying to sleep. You're just, you're just screwed. The ground is like an ice cube. And so I was stacking my pack. I was filling it with clothing and then I was trying to sleep on top of my pack to give me some, some, uh, insulation against the ground and steal a few hours of sleep. Uh, the fir- at first, the first night, it would run out every three hours, and then it would go flat. I'd wake up, put more wood in the stove, and blow it up, and go to sleep another three hours. Wake up, put the wood in the stove. The cycle goes on. Perfect tent mate. Exactly. Like Ryan and James were quite happy with the situation. Yeah, they're like this. Is, this rocks. <laughs> but uh, it was brutal for me. And um, I was mentioning how when you have a ground tarp like what you guys sell and what I use, I love that thing. But uh, it's not exactly going to stop a thorn mm-hmm. or a cactus or some kind of spiky object. And so I do my due diligence to move stuff out of the way, clear the ground. But there's always that possibility. And it can puncture your air pad pretty easily as well. And for those that just think, oh, I'm just going to patch the hole. That's not always that easy. <laughs> it, if it's a tiny, tiny hole, good luck finding it. It's luck, so yeah. hard to find the actual hole. I had a hole, second season. I couldn't find it. Um, I finally guessed um, with tenacious tape, trying to make an educated guess. Yeah. And I was wrong. Um, <laughs> like, a, like a this, yeah, this big a chunk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I tried yeah, to be yeah. like, well, this part of the fabric looks a little different. Maybe yeah. that's, you know, maybe and, that's spot. And, and maybe that's the spot. Um, turned out I had to get home and stick it in the bathtub and stand on it. And then all of a sudden I saw the bubbles and I was like, Oh, bingo, right. There's the hole. And yeah. I mean, but it was almost imperceptible and I've been bit a few times with that. And, uh, yeah, it can be really hard to find them. Lampers had a pad from REI that once the temperatures drop below like zero, the glue just all comes undone. So he brought that pad with him bear hunting on the, in spring and Mm -hmm. it was flat from day one. I I had one of he, he went the whole spring hunt without a pad. pad. I I had one where the baffle went in the middle of the night. Yeah. Um, to, it's a real thing. it, It is a real thing. I mean, there are risks with air pads, um, for years because I, I've, I slept on a, trip in Utah on Slick Rock for a few days because mm-hmm. I had an air pad that went belly up I couldn't find. So for years, I went with always with a closed cell mat and then some sort of like uh, I would take like a torso pro light or something. Yep. Um, and that, that was pretty much pretty much fail proof, right? I mean, I never had like a night where it was like, oh, this is going to stink. And I've tried to get back in the air mat game, right, mm-hmm. numerous times. But every time I keep getting kicked back out, I, I tried, <laughs> I try. I had an air mat. I thought, okay, this is a nice air mat. I'm, I'm going to go all in mm-hmm. and I'm not going to bring a backup. I'm going to try to live as the true ultralighters do. And that was the night that the baffle went out. <laughs> um, so yeah, then, then I had this other air mat that I took out. It was my second or third trip with it. And I was really, it was, it was close. It was a, Thermarest Pro Light Apex. Mm. So you know, I've been using the Pro Lights, and so luckily it does have some foam in it. Yeah. So it wasn't like freezing. It wasn't, but it still was noticeably cold when it yeah. lost. I mean, I was waking up because my rear end or my shoulders were cold when it was leaking out the air. Yeah. So I don't know. Now I got it fixed. I'm going to try because I really do think that it's a comfortable pad. But I might just be one of those guys who's like 85 on a closed cell pad with a little. Piece <laughs> you know, of I, air. Went, I went <laughs> like eight, nine years with that Thermarest Neolite Air, I, that and never got a hole in it until this trip. And so, and I've I've done a mass, a ton of hunts with that thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, just this this year. And, and what I think, what I got was an ember. A spark came out of the stove 
and landed on it just quick. I never quite saw it. I mean, I brushed a few sparks off when they pop out of the mm -hmm. stove as I'm loading it. I must have not got to that one fast enough, but the hole was so tiny. It took four hours to leak until eventually it, the hole got big enough and I could actually hear it when I laid down. I could hear the air coming out. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Put my hand there and I'm like, yes. That's funny because I suspected an ember on mine as well, mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't. And um, the reason I suspected an ember is, um, true story, I, I, ended, I packed up, I went up to camp, right, and there happened to be a wildfire in the area and it ended up congregating a lot of people hunting in an area, so it was a lot more crowded than than I would like, and it mm -hmm. was just kind of what it was, right? I mean, a lot of the hunting area was was closed. And I got up there, and I was setting up, and there was a couple, like, like MSR-style tents off. And, I mean, there's just not that many different places to camp, you know. I mean, it's either this or, you know, camping, you know. Right. So I set up my tent, and I had the Dyneema Cimarron and a little stove, and these two guys come up, and they're like, wow. We've been freezing our tail off. <laughs> They're like, we were just saying, maybe we should figure out one of these tents with a yeah. stove or something. We've been freezing. And I was, so I probably, I thought to myself, I got a fire going at night. I wasn't paying that much attention. I was more like, hey, when these guys come back, I'll, I'll you know, show them like a warm tent. Maybe they have some <laughs> sipping whiskey, mm -hmm. which they did, you know, um, and I thought maybe I, I just didn't pay attention, but it was it wasn't an ember with mine. It was just some other little hole. Oh, yeah. And I was I went and I, but because I thought it was an ember, I went and I was like, did our stoves not become as well with handling embers? Which is wrong. They still have the screen behind them and stuff, right? Yep, and yep. They're all good. I went expected it, but I ended up turning my stove. A little bit away. That's so. what I do now. Yeah. Yep. yep. Angle it. Angle it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's not pointed not perpendicular to you. It's mm -hmm. actually pointed at an angle yeah. up toward your, like where your face would be. Sure. Yeah. And so when it pops out, it, if anything does, it, it, it doesn't land right on my pad that's right. six inches away or five inches. Right. You know, right. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's. And it usually pops out right when you're loading it. It just, I open the door, open the door and just for like, a sec to put yeah. more wood in and yeah. of course it's, it's popping. Like it's it's like it's hot. waiting for yeah. you. Yeah, it's like to a, attack you. Yeah, open the door. <laughs> right. So, uh, but you have the Maddie Mick mat face, which, uh, it, you know, it's funny when I was, when my pad went flat, I filled my backpack full of clothing and puffies and pants and all this stuff to give me some space between the ground insulation. And then Ryan and I brought these little butt pads, you know, they're little square pads that are some kind of foam that you sit on when you're glassing. Mm -hmm. And I ended up taking Ryan's pad and my pad and laying those down and it gave me almost a full body length. So I'm laying in a stuffed backpack and in these two pads and those pads are incredible how much warmth they gave just because they're just a half inch bit of foam. So I made the mistake of actually taking the real sit pad from Thermal Rest, which is only about this big. <laughs> just yeah. four by eight. Ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was like trying to find the exact it's for the world's spot. smallest butt. Yeah, yeah. Like my butt's definitely bigger than this, right? And then, so I've been primarily using um, our mat. Um, <laughs> that uh, for as a, as as a backup for a while, and I went all in on this, thinking well, I'm not going to take a backup. I'm gonna go, and then I was uh, there. I was like, mm -hmm. Oh, I wish I would have brought well, that pad. The thing with the Maddie McMatt face pad is it's <laughs> super thin foam, right? But it's it sprawls out to about the size of my existing tarp almost that I yeah. use. Mm -hmm. Um. What's the dimensions? Yeah, it's it's almost too wide, right? It's almost mm -hmm. and by not like too wide, like it's too wide. Like there's it's plenty like of real two estate. sleeping pads wide. I think it's yeah. forty one yeah, 40, yeah. or forty two by which I like in a ground tarp or something. I, I want from the pole to the wall, kind of covered or mm -hmm. close to it. Not mm -hmm. all the way to the pole, maybe because they got the stove there, but close. This will do that, mm -hmm. and the, my full length. So, um, but it's thick, thick enough that. Any kind of like little thorns or rocks or sticks or something that might poke through and get my pad through a typical like thin sheet mm -hmm. tarp, it's not going to happen. Plus, now as we were messing around with it, 
you can fold that mm-hmm. and make a nice torso from your butt to your shoulder to your head. That's thick. How thick is it once so, you fold yeah, it like half, that? Half inch or so. Half yeah. inch. Yeah. yeah. So, so you, you could fold it in half and it'll be a quarter inch full length and fold it in half again and it'll be a torso half inch pad or half inch pad. That would have been legit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you get the full size pad, you know, uh, or ground tarp sort of thing experience with it. Plus, then you also get the, if you fold it up, you can actually sleep on it. Yeah. But you, the third thing that you mentioned, which I was just coming to the same conclusion with, is you can fold that thing up into a butt pad that's like built for kings. Spacious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spacious like a one inch. thick. Yes, yeah. so you can yeah. sit on that in glass all day. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you a question. Did you happen to have a dry sack with you? Oh, yeah. Because a few years ago, I went backpacking to do a couple peaks with my uh, son Owen, mm-hmm. and he was probably ten or eleven, maybe twelve, something like that, right? And you know how kids are—they're kind of all over the place. So I was, yeah. I was m- so worried about him carrying everything, you know, that he needed, that I realized when we got out that uh, I forgot a sleeping pad, mm. and I was like, "Okay, I'm worried all about my kid," and <laughs> now I am here. I am out here without, without a, a pad. Without a pad. I ended up taking a dry bag and stuffing it full of just organic matter and air, a mm-hmm. little bit of air in it. And while I'm not going to say that it was super comfy, um, <laughs> it was enough to make it through yeah. the night. Um, uh, yeah. There's a few places like on this last trip where I could have got fur boughs and stacked those pretty thick and then put something on top if I needed to. Where I, where I was with Ryan, it was like rocking like, thorns mm-hmm. like there wasn't much to work with when the pad went flat but i do like that this pad has all three purposes it can serve so if your pad does if you do lose your air pad you have this backup kind of option and it would work great mm-hmm. the, the the my question was the trade-off in weight but but basically it's about the same weight i can't believe how light the stuff is mm-hmm yeah, it's just seven ounces or something. It's like real close to seven ounces. Yeah, yeah like pull up the official specs. No, yeah, might, so, might uh, do that. So I mean, I'm, I've, let's see. If, and so what brought on the the creation of that? I mean, why why get all innovative in that regard? Is it because of the pad going flat and you were trying to think of something versatile? Yep. Or it was right with that in mind? Average weight is 8.9 ounces. Okay. Um, but, yeah, that that really was the thing. I mean... You know, air pads can and will fail given enough time, right? And mm-hmm. like I said, I've I've now been on the failure end of them four times. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe um, maybe I should just avoid them. I don't know, but I keep. It's, it's hard to sleep on like that three inches of nice air <laughs> and get a good night's sleep, and then go back to. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, Close it is. cell. It's hard. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 not, really it's hard. not for me. No, yeah, it's not. Yeah, yeah. It's I'll, really... I will gamble and make every time, and then I'll I'll make a, a pad out of my backpack. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I agree. There, there. It is hard to uh, kind of go back on that. And so, if I was going into the bush, drop for a couple of weeks, and I had no stove, let's be real here. If I was backpacking and I didn't have a stove as an option. I would change my a lot of my kit out, but there's something you know having a wood stove in in a shelter allows me to bring a down bag without too much worry. Allows me to bring an air pad that might go flat because I always have the heat from the stove to sort of compensate for these problems that I might run into. Yeah, in some very cold temperatures. As as we were talking stoves, and I don't want to, I don't want, I know I'm going to take some flack for this, but and. Uh, I know we've talked about the cub, and while I was waiting for you guys to show up, I went ahead and weighed what a what a U-turned cub would be, mm. and you know it doesn't save as much as a as a medium or large, of course. But I personally would be a fan of it. There really wouldn't be any downside, and it would get the cub down to a weight that is practically the same as what you're going to be carrying with a stove for cooking anyway. And at that point, it starts to become like, okay, cut whatever fuel can in half. Maybe I don't mm-hmm. need to bring a 16-ounce can of fuel. Maybe an 8-ounce can yep. w- would be sufficient because I can totally... W- it starts to change your kit. Yeah. I, In fact, we boiled a lot of snow 
we were at 11,000 feet and there was really no water up there. But having, again, the stove, the wood stove there, we and fill you, up the you're, pots. You're boiling on top of the stove. Yep. We just yeah. fill the, the um, you know, the jet boil pots. I like the mini-mo, the bigger, not the narrow cup, but the wide cup. Filling those up with snow, putting them on top of the stove. We're running the stove anyway. Mm-hmm. And it's just melting the snow as we're hanging out. And each night we just get a few of those pots melted and replenish our water. Have you seen and we our- didn't have to burn any kind of fuel to do it. Mm-hmm. Have you seen our titanium mug? No. You haven't? Oh, we should show you that. I know it's around here somewhere. Um, I had a question about something I would like to have built or mm, dis- okay. discovered yeah. or something. So, um, you know, the, the top half of the teepee gets really warm, mm-hmm. you know, as the heat goes up and you stand up and it's pretty hot up there down where you're laying down. It's a lot cooler. Uh, so what I often use is a tripod. I'll set up like this tripod here, get it. It's up in the, above, up above the stove and I'll hang my gaiters and my boots or whatever off of that. And it's just a, a dev- it's just a way to get my gear up high where it'll dry really quick. But one of the things I wanted to do was attach like um, a large, like dry sack kind of bag that I could just fill with snow, like a ton of snow and just hang it from the bottom of that tripod, you know, up there where that snow will just melt all night. Hmm. Because snow, you know, when you grab snow and we, I drank, I it basically, takes forever. I used a ton of I mean, it took forever. It was a pain in the butt. And there's really not a lot of other options. Because if you fill your pot with snow, you end up with about a, one inch of water by the time it melts. Mm-hmm. So you really have to collect a lot of snow to get a decent amount of water. It's like three times the snow to like what you're going to get three mm-hmm. to one with water. So having a um, just something I could just fill that's large that I can hang... Let it kind of pre-melt. And just let it burn. Like, as the stove burns all night, it just is melting into So you know how to do that? Are you familiar with our, uh, it's on our YouTube, but we, we've we advocated for quite a while, Prusik on the pole? Prusik? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so. Yep, you tie a Prusik to, knot yeah, on tie, the pole? Yeah, tie a Prusik on the pole and then a little mm-hmm. carabiner and you can clip all sorts of things on there. Um, I do think at some point. You know, in typical ultralight fashion, um, we've usually advocated um, knowledge over over very specific, like here's your thing that makes a prusik on the pole for you. Uh-huh. Right. right. Um, but I do think, uh, I know I've talked about making some sort of clamp that fits on there just so it makes it easier and people don't have to Google up how to tie a prusik. You yeah. know? But generally about 28 inches of cordage. And a waterman's knot, and then give it three, four wraps on the pole, and you can clip boots or whatever on there pretty solidly. Well, and I've done it between two tripods where we set them up. But you could tie a prusik to the pole and string and, it to the tripod, mm-hmm. and you have a little line there. You can also run it to the tie out as well yeah. and put a couple little loops in it along the way. In the red cliff, in the canopy, we had a rope that went around in the loops up mm-hmm. there and we were hanging gloves and socks and all kinds of stuff up there and it worked great to dry out all your gear. Yeah. And especially on the, on the Dyneema one, it'll work better. We've typically tried what what you had up there were the loops for the liner, right? Mm-hmm. And the cool thing about Dyneema is you want loops on your tent. You can add loops wherever with some sticky tape, right? Mm-hmm. And that should be on our site sometime, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, I know we've provided those loops to customers that have ordered Dyneema tents that wanted to hang something specifically somewhere. And it's like, here you go. Just put it wherever you feel like. And it works really well. But in the nylon tents, the reason we advocate kind of against it is because you're putting weight on the canopy, right? And And it sags. And it's messing with the structure of the canopy. Yeah. Because Dyneema really has no stretch, it's not as big a deal, especially if it's stuff like socks or gloves or something that aren't super heavy right yeah i mean maybe some knee-high boots that'd probably be way too much yeah um but that's why i like using the tripod here just right next to the stove pipe just and when i have the foot down all the way but the center head up all the way it's it's very narrow footprint for the tripod but all that height and it, it was it's perfect 
what I want though is some kind of, and I could use a dry sack of some kind, but mm-hmm. just something that, uh, cause that snow melted really fast when we got it up high mm-hmm. within an hour, we were melting massive, but it needed massive amounts of snow, but I needed some kind of container that was packable. And so we had this, uh, air sack that you pump your pad with, you sure. know, mm-hmm. something like that with a spout or. Mm-hmm. You know, something super lightweight where you can just fill that up with snow, boom, hang that bag, and then in the morning you have three liters of water. Even if you had one of those hydrate, like zip top hydration type things, those would work pretty well because they would allow you to scoop up pretty full thing of snow exactly. right off the bat. So I'm thinking something that like there. that in my head, some kind of snow melter. Yeah, mm-hmm. hang, hang, mm-hmm. hang, hang that up there, hang hang that with a press of kind of pole, and and probably yeah, you probably if you had one of those hydration things with the zip top hydration mm-hmm. type uh mm-hmm. you probably could yeah then open it up and pretty much have your own little water faucet coming from a yeah bag. i got yeah. it <laughs> the, 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 the platy bag is like that isn't it the, it is the initial yeah platy i've bag. noticed like some mm-hmm. of those thicker bags they don't let the heat get mm-hmm. in as well um as as the thinner ones but they almost insulate a little bit even like a msr like a drum light like the little it pro- red. that would probably work really well actually it's canvas kind of on the outside a little bit mm-hmm. uh that that it just depends the problem with snow is packing packing it into things in, getting it in right there, yeah. and it's not like you you're sticking it under a faucet and you're just letting it fill up right and so you mm-hmm. get something like the drum you're having to pack it in there and yeah. pack it in there that's why I, that's I did what... have a dry sack and i just like a little sea to summit dry sack mm-hmm. and i just scooped tons of snow into it and then just buckled it and hung it yeah. over here and it and it would melt but i i kind of want something that's more designed for it where mm. you, you can get the water mm-hmm. out of it more easily yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah the cub back to that discussion mm-hmm. about what size shelter do you think that thing can heat one thing i'll say is i like big wood because it just burns lo- longer. Mm-hmm. Not quite as hot, but it'll just give me a good long burn. The, the Cub can do... I've known people that have used it in like four-man size and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It has the airflow for it, right? It just doesn't have the real estate to put much big wood in, right? So if you're if you're burning finger-sized sticks and smaller, um, you'll, you can heat a four-man relatively well. Uh, you're going to be loading it just often, though. That's going to yeah. be the thing. That's going to be the downside. Um, however, in, in the case, like, I wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me, like, say, in archery season that much. Because right. archery season, half the time, I don't even, I, yeah, 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 yeah. you know. It's just if it gets, you know, if it rains on you yeah, and you're a little yeah, wet, yeah. you're like, man, I like to yeah, yeah, have yeah. some heat. Yeah, and, and you could cook with it and do some things like that and heat up some water and it wouldn't be a deal, but it gives you that dual usage. But as you get towards, you know, third season, fourth season, I, I definitely favor the larger stoves myself, so. Um, yeah, and I think the the Cub works really well in, like, our Silex. Yeah, I was going to uh, ask about that. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So that Silex is kind of like, uh, with a stove in it, a one-man, um, mm-hmm. but it's so like comfy there's lots like a, of like a room. Space, spacious yeah. yeah but yet uh it's it, it 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 seals down to the ground pretty pretty tight because i use the eolus as well mm-hmm. and uh, that one just provides more airflow more of a you know a three season or two season type shelter uh but using that silex i really liked it in new zealand because you know you could really get some heat trapped in there yeah and uh, we are working on a big version of the Silex that'll be more of, uh, it won't be as big as the Cimarron, but it'll be bigger than the Olus, um, somewhere in that range. I No no real ETA on it, yeah. but the Silex has seemed to go over really well so far, mm-hmm. um, the reviews. Is that about a $200 really shelter? Yeah. Yeah, 100, 189 bucks I think, for the yes. Silex. Man, it's um, just legit. Yeah. And how much does the Sil Nylon Silex weigh? Uh, I think it's about 17, 18. Uh, I think it's, it's right around a pound. Just I mean, about a pound. It's about the same as a tarp, uh, as, as like mm-hmm. a 10 by 10 tarp. You're using your own poles. Yep. Yeah. Your and own so, trekking poles. Yeah, Tre- about so a one pound tent. Yeah. And then the cub weighs 
Yeah. The stove. The po- it's under two pounds. I mean, if you did it in a uh, U-turnish, it would probably get pretty darn close. Well, the titanium parts I measured are 13 ounces on that. So, but with the cut or with the, if you U-turned it, it would end up being about nine ounces and then three for legs at so 12 and then whatever for pipe at a 1.5 per foot in the pipe. So, I mean, you can get to about 18 ounces mm-hmm. somewhere in there, wow. like barely right around a pound, like, like about, about what like mm-hmm. your pocket rocket and some fuel yep. or something like that's going to run you. What's nice about it is the footprint. It's so much smaller than like a Cimarron. Mm-hmm. So there yeah. were, you know, whenever I'm setting up the Cimarron, it's still a lot easier than some of the other floorless shelters I've owned. Um, you're getting so much space, eight and a half by nine and a half feet, something like that. Yeah. yeah and and there's some shaping that adds to it. But when you're dealing with the, the Silex, you just, you know, you can just fit that in a lot of places. You can't fit the bigger tent. And so when you're on those mountains hunting, uh, it's really nice to have something that can go on a deer bed or something. Yeah. The, the, the Silex will really work in it. It, it really is the same footprint as like a two person hubba style tent. It really yeah. is. Um, and it's pretty much as, um, pretty much as space efficient as well. You know, I mean, it's, it's very efficient. Um, we've keep getting asked by people like, well, can a six foot person sleep in there with, and it's like, and, yes. <laughs> and it's like, you know, you, I've been kind of jokingly saying like, man, a seven footer on a three inch pad can fit. It's, it's surprisingly roomy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and it is, you know. And just with the, with the, like this, going back to the, like the Silex and the Cub, I mean, that's for your solo hunter, yeah. right? And like somebody who wants to, doesn't have a bunch of people to go with, Ultra you know, hunt by himself, wants ultralight, the wants a stove, be mobile, uh, be super mobile. It's also very economical. Mm-hmm. I mean, that shelter is so affordable. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I, I think in, we get back to like the Silex is is a, is a tarp. Like it, it. I like to think of it as like it's better than a tarp, mm-hmm. um, but lighter than a tent, right? So, so yep. there's like for 189 bucks, it's really hard not to have one yep. as almost an emergency type shelter that you can just pack with you. <laughs> And you could throw up. That zipperless design is nice. And other, like the Eolus, the egress is a little rough. With the Silex, it's it's very large. You mm-hmm. can get in and out. Yeah, the Eolus opens up. The goal with the Eolus was to open up as much as your. Uh, and um, uh, I hope we don't get someone complaining about Hubba style, but I'm just going to say Hubba, you know, the two person. Mm-hmm dual entry, dual vestibule tents, they generally are about 39 to 40 inches tall. And the zippered entry is generally about 35 inches. The Olus opens up the same as that, you know, on on the measurements. Now the Silex goes up 44, 45 inches. I mean, it's, it's really easy to get in and out of, Mm -hmm. you know, so. Yep. Yeah, totally. And then, um, pair that with a nest inside too. So you can, we can put a nest on the inside, uh, keep all the bugs out and stuff and people, you know, really yep. worried about that and those floorless type sh- stuff. But, but yeah, I mean, the Silex alone is, there's no reason not to have it. Um, mainly because you could pitch it to just an emergency shelter yep. when it's, if the storm rolls in real quick and get in, you can leave a door open, you know, you could almost glass, glass right out of it. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. You really could pitch it and just gla- use it as a glassing shelter almost. Yeah, know? totally. How, how how well does it handle wind and storm compared to the, like the Cimarron? Really well. It mm-hmm. seems like it's a little better built for just just a, an all-out <laughs> storm than like a teepee. Totally. It's just not as big. Yeah. Right? So it doesn't it, have the height. Yeah, being closer to the ground, all those things just help it mm-hmm. like shed, shed the wind. Um, and then if you – because you have to pitch it with your trekking poles, you have to pitch it pretty tight. Right, those those yep. stake out. You got to pitch it pretty tight. Um, that helps as well. Yeah, you know. Um, well, there's some there's some hidden tricks in there too. What the zipperless design, the way it's oriented, actually helps build a stronger shelter. Um, not just because of the absence of zipper, but because it allows us to orient fabrics in their strength without regards to the zipper. Basically, no matter who's tent. There's going to be areas that are going to be stronger and weaker within a shelter, depending on the fabric orientation. So the weak parts are actually oriented on the zipper, which are essentially reinforced by the cordage. So the cordage is 
acting as strengthening those where you couldn't put a zipper there. Gotcha. So it, it allows the rest of it to actually be built to be stronger rigid. and more stable and mm-hmm. rigid. The one thing I've noticed with the Cimarron, as I set it up, um, if I want a lot of height out of it, I get a little bigger gap around the base. Mm-hmm. If I want it, um, if I want that gap, and, and it's funny because when you add just a few inches of height, you add a lot of inches of diameter. It's it's crazy, like how much, I don't I mean, know the and math. When you say inches, you just mean like inches in the pole. Length. Yeah. Like when you I, make the pole a little bit I longer. make it taller mm-hmm. in the middle, it's like the it gets wider. The tank gets quite a bit wider. And then when I lower that pole just a few inches, the cl- sides clo- the close in quite a bit more. It's mm-hmm. And it's pretty noticeable, you know. Mm-hmm. You're getting a lot closer to the center when when you got it pitched really tight to the ground yeah but when it's really cold and i'm trying to keep the wind from coming out under it you know i find that i like i like to pitch it tight to the ground a little more but it it then it makes it a little bit smaller up higher you know Mm -hmm. um but one thing i like to do is i like to set it up real tall if i've got the right kind of setup i might and i know which way the prevailing wind is coming I'll set up so that side's really tight to the ground, but the other the other side is we're using bungees uh, mm-hmm. on your on the prototype that I've been borrowing from you. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> You've got the bungee cord there that I use on one end, and then the other end I kind of actually t- you know, stake it tight to the ground mm-hmm. with rope, and then that way um, I can sort of get a little f- few more inches out of it while also keeping the wind from sucking my heat mm-hmm. out. But my favorite way to set it up really is just to bungee it all the way around and then jack that sucker to the, to the sky. <laughs> and I have like three or four inches of three inches, maybe of gap around the base. Mm. And then, um, if I got the time and it's the right location, I just stack rocks around it I, I actually and windbreak it. And that thing, and we even push snow up against it mm-hmm. and it is just, it just feels it's a castle. That's actually what I, I did. <laughs> um, the first or one of the nights um, when I was out hunting, it I was camped on snow, but there wasn't that much snow. It was two, three inches on the ground, mm-hmm. and it was cold and kind of windy. So I had it locked down pretty tight. And then one night it snowed probably about eight inches. Mm-hmm. And then the next day when I was clearing the snow off, I was like, you know what? I'm going to raise this thing up and put put a little snow fort around yeah. the outside. And so, yeah, I raised it up probably four or five inches off the ground and made my little windbreak with the snow and was like, okay, cool. Yeah. And I've noticed, uh, when we were in New Zealand, we ran into the same thing. Lampers and I, we were up at the top of the mountain. There's no, we either drop way down or we just set up on like three feet of deep snow mm-hmm. and there was no clearing that snow out. I mean, it's, it's a snow drift. It's deep. And it was hard, pretty wet snow. Uh, and people, then they're like, well, how am I going to stake it down and blah, blah, blah. If you haven't done it before, it's actually pretty simple. Um, we packed it down. And you stomped on it and mm-hmm. kind of packed the snow. So, mm-hmm. it, would, so it was kind of the, done settling. They, they call it work hardening. Yeah. Work hardening. Work snow. hardening so the work, snow. Pack, pack, pack. And so we did that. And then we put the teepee on top of it. And you kind of have a little wall that you've built because you've punched the center down where you're going to sleep. Yeah. And then when you put those stakes into the snow, they freeze. They like, I don't remember what they call it. Uh, you, you can do them like a dead man. Dead man. You can stick them underneath mm-hmm. and turn them to the side a little bit. Mm-hmm. A lot of times I'll use sticks because um, sticks, well, if there's really deep snow, I'll mm-hmm. take and break off sticks like this when pitching a tent. But a lot of times even just taking a stick this big and turning it sideways. Eight, 10 inches, it. 12 inches. Yeah. And they're kind of grippy too. I mean, mm-hmm. like a steak, a tent steak is, does not have the same amount of friction as like a stick if you can do it that way. So, so you kind of dig a little hole. To, you have the rope tied to the stick. Mm-hmm. You lay it in the hole horizontally. Throw yeah. the snow on it, stomp on it, and you have a rock hard, solid. Yeah. In, like, and if in you, fact, in the morning when you want to take that shelter down <laughs> – it's a bit of a job because yeah. those things are frozen in there. It's the advantage of using a stick is you can leave it there. <laughs> yeah. You just untie it. That's right? true. Um, and then also you want to like work hard in that snow too. 
right? So mm-hmm. you want to stomp where you're going to put that stake in, or if you're going to dead man it sideways or whatnot, yeah. you want to pack that snow nice and tight first and then dig your hole. Or, and then, then stick, put your stake in. Put your stake in. Now, yeah. if you're getting frozen ground, you can use like nails or something, right? Mm-hmm. Um, another thing you can do, which is a bit easier to extract, and I've done this before, is like concrete screws with a tiny little ratchet. Like, oh. I mean, like a little micro ratchet and mm-hmm. a concrete screew. If you can just get started, then you can just in yeah. really frozen ground. We typically in frozen ground or in just in rocky ground where it seems impossible to get um, a stake in, Ryan and I just use rocks, t- tie off to some rocks. Mm-hmm. And then uh, usually tie off to a heavy rock and then put a rock on the rope and kind of stack a pile of rocks in a couple of spots. Yeah, you can do that. And I mean, you can do that. That's similar to what you do, like, say, on gravel bars in Alaska mm-hmm. and stuff as well. So Yeah. Mm-hmm. So far, we've been in some very heavy windstorms with it. I don't know how... F- on the the last mule deer hunt in the film in the videos that people will watch, you can see like the entire side is just blowing in like mm. you know six inches. I mean, just and the stove is blaring and it's super toasty in there, and the whole sides go and it just uh, held up just fine. So I don't know what it can take. I haven't I haven't taken it. I've basically used it in four season conditions uh, for I don't know how many days. Yeah, you've been you've been a pretty hardcore SO gear tester the last few months. I would say um, fifteen, at least forty five days, forty five nights. I've spent in fourth fourth season temperatures. Oh yeah, you've 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 been to New Zealand in it. You've been to Kodiak. You've been to. Um, here and you've also been used it in to, Idaho, used yeah. it in Colorado, and, and and that's the Dyneema, right? That's yes. the Dyneema yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, one thing that I have noticed is I've got a lot of little holes from the embers. Yeah, and uh, mm-hmm. so any kind of patch, you know, I can use some tenacious tape. We talked about that mm-hmm. in the field, but what's better is to actually use Cuban fiber tape. Tape. Yeah, and you guys have that yet. Almost. You said you almost. We're, we're working. We're, we're, getting, we're getting there. We're yeah, getting there. yeah, we're getting there. I mean, we've, we've been providing it. We've been, you, but we don't have it available on the site. We'll need, we need to get that available on the site. And, but it's as simple you know, as just putting it over the hole. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's as simple it's, as putting it over the hole. And just then, like Tenacious Tape, only yeah. it's, it's just backed essentially with Dyneema. Yeah. yeah. So the one thing I was asking was, you know, how how do I prevent the embers from, you know, coming out of the stove and landing on, on the mm-hmm. tent and going to need probably a little more stove pipe. And I think that's really the consensus is so my stove pipe just isn't quite tall enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tall so. enough. And then wood as well, right? Like the, that super sappy well, wood can be kind of, I have it burning super hot, you know, cause Lampers and I are right next to each other. There's that cool photo. Uh, I noticed you guys posted the other day that Sylvester mm. took mm-hmm. oh, of that, us on yeah, the ridge that was an awesome with photo. those two together. Well, Ryan's tent is blowing right to my tent. Uh, so the embers would come out and land on it. We, I didn't notice. Yeah. You guys need. So it was clear. So, so you guys got to sit. You guys got to like split up. <laughs> we can't bit. be setting up like right next yeah, to you each guys, other. You guys need a little bit longer stovepipes. I think Ryan's stovepipe was originally for a bug out or something, right? And Mine's little, taller than his. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. taller than his. And, but not uh, quite tall enough. I think, I think maybe probably another. Yeah, there's really no, there really isn't much of a disadvantage of having an extra foot uh, other than that it's going to be an extra two ounces of, or close. Yeah, it's uh, worth it though, weight. I think. And we're talking Cimarron, we recommend six feet yeah. stovepipe, so yep. six and a half to seven Ryan's, might be a, a, a good move. From his bug out set system, it seems like a different gauge uh, no, it's pipe. The same. Is it the same? Mine's just crinkled to all get out, you know. <laughs> So how do you set up? So for people who don't know, I get a pipe and it, it's got a memory. It wants to lay down a certain way because it's rolled like that. Okay. And so when I roll it out, so it's flat picture, like a tube of aluminum foil, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you're going to unroll that thing six feet and then you're going to fold it into a, a r- cylinder, a six foot cylinder. Mm-hmm. 
Well, it doesn't want to go into a cylinder because it's folded the other way, like a roll of tinfoil. So I grabbed it. I hit the road. I'm in the mountains. I didn't set it up beforehand because you basically, when you heat it up, it'll get a new memory Mm -hmm. for it as well. So it'll have the memory of it being, it'll fold like tinfoil, but also roll the other direction into your pipe. Mm -hmm. But that first time you need to roll it into the pipe, that son of a gun doesn't want to do it. So I was I was out in the woods the same way. I had not I had been busy. I hadn't gotten a chance to uh, burn it in and stuff on my and own. And that's the term I, you use yeah, to, to yeah. set it so, up. So so I'm I'm out in the mountains same way. I'm putting together a U-turn stove, and then I'm having to put together fresh a, pipe, a fresh pipe, right? And the the ideal thing the ideal thing is if you have a piece of PVC and a person yeah. to help you, right? You'll get a much cleaner thing, cleaner roll. The person that is probably the best I've ever seen at it is Angela. Mm-hmm. Um, for whatever reason, I think maybe us guys want to muscle it, and maybe <laughs> girls are a little more patient. Um, but uh, no, <laughs> no, no. I'm I'm totally. Patient. I can roll this thing. I am, uh, I yeah. roll this thing. Oh man, uh, I just folded it in yeah, half. Yeah. I I just yeah. I messed that thing up. Yeah. on some rocky hillside. Yeah, I'm so to, and it's thin, right? Like, uh-huh. like yeah, for people who can't see it or don't know what it is. So there it, there is a way thin. to kind of reset that process, and so it's going to take you uh, a little while at home, and it'll be to roll it the opposite of its initial rolling like this. So if it rolled this way, roll it the other way, right? So you're going kind of against the When it's the in the pipe or in the storage position. In the storage position. position so right. when it's in the storage position, which is the short, yeah. like tin, like your tinfoil roll mm-hmm. kind of style, you're saying in that storage position, roll it the opposite way that it that it Want, came. Yeah, that it, went, that it wants okay. to roll. And then take it and stick it on your grill or in your oven at about mm-hmm. 450 degrees for 20, 30 minutes or something. Okay. Right? Let it cool off and then start the whole process over again. And that kind of takes and gets rid of, like if you have a kink in it, mm-hmm. it kind of takes and gets rid of that and then it anneals it back that way and then you start it over again. Nice. I'm going to have to try that. Yeah. So when you when you burn it in the second time or the first time, what's the best way to do that? The absolute perfect way is to have a buddy and to probably probably like probably get your daughter and your wife to do it because mm-hmm. they're probably more patient and more delicate. Yes, and okay. and, uh, and get it with a put gloves on them and and have a piece of PVC and they'll they'll probably roll it better than any of us can, right? And so then, you just roll it out, mm-hmm. roll it out on a flat piece of ground, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then set a piece of PVC in the middle of it? Yeah, basically at one one edge and then start to roll over that PVC. Okay. You know, and then to do it perfectly, then you should take the pipe and put it on the stove and burn it one way, let it cool, then flip the pipe upside down and burn on the other side because you have a very hot temperature close here that Kneels it. It kneels and you're talking about in the wood stove yeah, in the teepee, in, actual teepee. Yeah, when you're burn when you're burn actually it burn in. it in, burn yeah. it in once, one direction, let the fire go out, flip, flip it, it around and burn it the other way. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Huh? I've never done that. I've always burned it the exact same way every time. Yeah, that will get it the the most consistent all the way around because you'll notice when you burn it, say at the one edge, mm-hmm. the first time, like you go out and you go take the pipe again and you'll or roll it and you'll roll pretty tight at this end, but on the other side, it'll be a little more like this, right? So if you do, do I care post- about that? Cause I mean, it works just the same like, as far as I can tell. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes it easier to put together okay. right? because it, it wants to be tighter to itself. Um, you get some style points. Yeah, right? you get some. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, you're this. talking when about you- <laughs> style anyway, if you got a when, couple little dings in it, when you have you your know? park, your spark arrestor in there, Mm-hmm. Does the pipe go over the entire spark arrestor, or does it go inside? Over. goes over. Over. See, Ryan? I told you it goes <laughs> over. Yes, over. Over. It doesn't go inside. You can't turn the, the right. dealio as right. well, mm-hmm. the dampener. Right. Yeah, yeah. So you can't, actually. Like, if you get it inside the damper, mm-hmm. it's it's not going to turn that flap. It's going to oh, sit on the flap. Lampers has found a way to sort of... <laughs> to make it work. <laughs> Um, no, definitely. So over the top of the damper, yeah. 
Um, That's how I've always run it. Slide a ring down too. Yep. To keep it nice and tight around yep. that damper. Um, and if you can lay it almost on the the pin, right? The pin that goes through the damper. If That's you can, how I do it. If you can mm-hmm. get it on there, it'll create some friction. Yep. That so allows the pin the damp- just roll on its own. Exactly. So. And, and yeah, it'll help. They keep the we're on the same place. page. Yeah, yeah. So now right. here's the problem with how Ryan's doing it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what he's doing is putting it inside, mm-hmm. and that pipe is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, and it's also as it gets hot uh, over time, right? Yeah. And then it's going to not want to get around the other pipe, and then what happens? And this is the whole little redoing it issue. Uh, what I've seen is that when that happens, a lot of times it starts to spiral a little bit mm. and get, so it's not say round and flat, right. it gets a little bit spiraled and then you end up with eventually having a hard time being like, Hey, this thing doesn't really like, so for instance, where Dave and Amy Freeman, um, they had that issue. I mean, they were used, they used it for almost a year contiguous, mm-hmm. right? Um, but that was after a while and if the pipe going inside over time it starts to develop yeah. a natural spiral and then you'll end up having to redo it yep, yep. reset it mm-hmm. one thing i've noticed of course it is, sounds like he needs a larger pipe anyway so yeah the the spark arrester has popped out many times mm-hmm. uh, due to just putting it inside the bag inside the bag and then like hauling it around mm-hmm. is there anything you that, that that is out there to keep that thing from getting crushed the spark arrestor, or the, yeah, or, like or the, the damper, the damper. Well, we showed you deal. that tube that we're yeah. going to start offering for sale. Because um, that right there would be really nice to be able to mm-hmm. slide that in there to keep it. Because it, it'll be pancake sometimes, and then I'm like smashing it back, and then I'm taking the spark arrestor and I'm fitting it in there, and I have to flatten it because it's dome shaped like a net, and then it'll get too small yeah. on itself, and it will fall right the, out. The tube will work really well, and the tube allows you to. Take it and um, and so for those that the the tube is I wouldn't say it's like an algae bottle but it, it's a it's a little cylinder tube mm-hmm. that you can put the pipe and the damper and all that stuff in. Um, part of That'd the problem, handy. Yeah, part of the Just problem to protect is that stuff from getting. Yeah, part smashed. of the problem is is that you're mm-hmm. taking a flat stove and then a round pipe and stuff and you're putting it somewhere in your pack and then you might be compressing the heck out of your pack or mm-hmm. compressing something to it. I always try it, to right? put it on the top and I always right. try to be gentle, but I end up bending the but, heck out. Right, of right. So it allows you to separate the round things out. You can throw the. Mm-hmm. They will be by themselves. Perfect. You can put them in a bottle pocket or yeah. something like that. It looks kind of like a tennis ball. Yeah, exactly. Plastic cylinder. Yeah. yeah. I mean, probably people could take tennis the ball tennis holder. ball pro to, pro and not even buy ours. They can mm-hmm. probably just use this. Mm-hmm. So, you know. Gotcha. Yeah. The, the only the thing you have to be able to do is pull your flap out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And get, get your flap out. Which um, that's just pushing it a little bit to get it long and then you pull the flap out. Squeeze it and yeah. fish it out of there. But, yeah. but you do have to kind of disassemble the damper to get it in the tube. Yep. Um, which, which isn't too bad. And then there's that one I showed you, which is the Ultra yes. the other day. Mm-hmm. And the Ultra is pretty slick. I I, I, I prefer the Ultra um, if I'm not trying to Shave sa- weight. save every little ounce possible. And that's the Ultra, the Ultra Spark Arrestor. Yeah. yeah. So. yeah. And what's the concept behind that? You described it to me, but, but people listening. Well, the concept is it allows you to dump it right and it also allows you to open it a little bit so we'll go kind of into the technical so spark arresters are going to reduce airflow by 30 to 40 percent right so and i'm not advocating you do this but if you want the u-turn to create the same amount of airflow as the bigger pipe you can ditch the arrestor and have an extra foot of pipe and you're going to create the same airflow you know if you just do the math behind it you'll you'll get the same airflow Mm -hmm. out of less pipe right um, there's, there's a little trade-off. You'll want a little longer pipe to help avoid that. The sparks. The sparks. And to be clear, just so in the different burn things, not talking stoves, but you know, when, when there's forest fire dangers and mm-hmm. you know that you're under, what is it? I'm trying to remember the terms, but it's like burn one, burn two, or level yeah. one, level two or whatever. There, there, there is a requirement on the first, there at one level, you cannot, Burn at all. Burn at all, right? Mm. At the other level, you can burn an enclosed wood stove that has a spark Spark arrestor in it. So, just to be clear, you know, if you go ahead and legal, yeah, if you ditch Mm -hmm. it, you're not going to fit into that. 
you know, start a forest fire. Yeah. You're not going to fit into that. And if mm-hmm. you're trying to do things, say like, like our stoves have been used a fair amount in the Grand Canyon. Yep. Uh, they approve them on rafting trips all the time there. Um, they prefer them because people end up burning a lot less wood and stuff, um, than they would with a fire pan, but it's you control. Yeah. But you're going to need the arrestor to get through yeah. some of these legal hoops and stuff at times. Yep. Right. So what can happen in extreme cold? Or with people that run Duraflame logs often mm-hmm. is you can get soot built up in your pipe. And when you start a fire in your stove, um, it your pipe is heating up a little bit, but it doesn't have like a strong draft. It's not like going whoosh, the air coming through. It's just starting. And some of that pops down, back down in, and can fill up. It also can happen with Duraflame logs. They're mm. pretty common cause of that as well. Okay. But a lot of times it's... It's cold and it's stuck on the pipe and then it starts to fall back off. So you're, you're losing airflow. Yeah. And so then that comes in. Sometimes it actually makes it like, whoa, you're wondering like, whoa, are my pipe's not working or something, right? Yeah. You're, uh, you're smoking oh, yourself out. Yeah, you're right? smoking like, yourself yeah, out, right? It won't drop. So the, the Ultra basically allows it to be dumped. Right. So yeah, if you that, just turn it and yeah, the spark arrestor yeah, dumps. Right. And then And it does have some other advantages too. I mean, if you're wanting to create maximum airflow like, just for a little bit, yeah. you can just turn it, yeah. let it just yeah. burn and then yeah. let it go back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let it go back. So hmm, yeah. I like that. It looks a little more robust too. The spark arrestor is kind of uh Yeah, it's a heavier duty. It's material. a heavier duty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean it's it's cut out of Relatively heavy stainless. Um, the other arrestor, you burn it long enough, you're going to have to replace it. But yeah. it's it's pretty similar with every stove out there. You know, I mean, um, they're all some sort of little arrestor for the most part, you know, yep. that drop down. So, Well, hmm. I think that's a lot of info for people to, to take in, to, to process. Um, I've, I uh, enjoyed coming down and checking out the place. Uh, anything you want to tell people about before we close this show? We'll do some more because you've got new stuff coming down the pipeline all the time. But Check out our U-turn, which will be coming out. Again, I don't know when this will come out. Check out the U-turn. Um, Black Friday, we'll always have a sale going into that okay. weekend, which is, is the only it's time up here very only soon. time our stuff is on sale. Uh, so it's a good time to get on that. And then also um, our flight series packs we're looking at. Oh, yeah. Early 2020 coming out, early 2020. Um, probably come to the Western Hunt Expo and find them Check there them for the first time. Yeah. yeah. And so you also have another pack that you're coming out with. Short tail. The short tail. Right. Just kind of a, a day pack. It's pretty sick. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's one of those things, you know, like we were talking about the whole perfection stuff, right? And we kind of, we really... I think Lacey did a really good job on the first proto of it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, but we got all of us on the phone, you know, you, me, Lacey. We got Nathan on the phone from Tennessee trying to get something that works for the person on the eastern whitetail side, something that works for the western mountain hunter, and something that works for the people on Kodiak. You know, we're trying to get it as close to filling the right needs for all of that. And I mean, you had some good points. You and Nathan had some good points on you're in the tree stand and you know, you don't want to see your release go <laughs> 30 feet to the ground. Yeah. That's happened to me a few times. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this, and this is like a day pack basically. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe a little bit bigger than that, but, mm-hmm. but definitely in that day's pack realm. Um, and then we're also playing with some sort of, um, whatever, another bag that we're going to make to accompany it so you yep. could take it for multi-day multi-day three days yeah, and you mm-hmm. drop the bag what's the flight pack that you mentioned yeah so um the flight pack is going to be again around that like day pack size mm-hmm. um but it it's not going to be something that attaches to our current frame yeah it's going to be a, its own standalone pack um we're shooting for that two pound range yeah two um, two and a half pound and and to carry and perform better and be more durable than any other pack in the two, two and a half pound range. Yeah. And I mean, uh, I'm going to, I'll separate them out saying our current pack, you know, we consider that a pretty heavy load capable pack, especially if you get it configured right. You know, um, we're shooting for very similar comfort, uh, but we really think the flight will 
go up to about 40 pounds well. That being said, I still think that it will carry as well as about anything on the market that is not a hunting pack. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you take mm -hmm. all the other brands, and I mean, I've seen people carry out hunting loads and stuff, elk quarters, and I yeah. thought, well. And like a Kelty or and, something. And, uh, and, and I thought like, well, the flight will carry just as well as that pack will. Yeah. You know, because I see, I see flaws like barreling or not enough frame height or things like that. So the flight will feel very similar to our bigger pack, um, for the hunter, um, where it will work really well is for scouting and things like that. Right. Day, day yeah. trips, hunting day. out of the truck, um, yeah. hunting out of a base camp, right. Where you can, you can get to really easy, um, get your first load out, you know, get your mm -hmm. back straps, tenderloins, some things like that out. Um, mm -hmm. scouting, going up and just spotting from somewhere, right. things like that. So, yeah, I kind of want a different pack. If I'm just going up to uh, glass and spend the day and, uh, scout, I don't ever, I don't need the pack that's going to be able to carry more than a hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. I need just a, a different setup for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. It's just when I'm getting ready to carry out, you know, an animal, if, if I am blessed with success right? where you, you, you it's a different kind of thing. Your, your REI brand packs just aren't going to take you there. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, definitely not. Agreed. So, well, awesome. Thanks cool. for uh, coming on the podcast guys. Folks, no worries. folks Thank listening, you. Thank you. uh, yeah, check out Seek Outside. Uh, Black Friday's coming up in a couple of weeks here, mm -hmm. and uh, that's your only sell of the year that you do, pretty much. His historically, so yes. So pay attention, folks. Black yes. Friday, check it out. What kind of deals can they look forward to? Like Not that much. I just, mean- Just a little discount? We go about 10%. That's okay. about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, typically we have- They've done very well at the 10% mark. A yeah. um, couple other things I'd like to add. 10% is good when you're adding it on top of some of these Dyneema and stuff like that. A mm -hmm. mm -hmm. couple other little blurbs. Um, go to our Facebook groups if you want to find out info or ask information. A lot of people are responding there. Our YouTube channel has a lot of technical information. Um, we have a survey. Um, you want to... Help us make decisions about where we're going. Um, you can score a ten percent discount on awesome. answering our survey. You do not need to be a current customer, but you can put in types of gear that you'd like to see and what your activity profile is and stuff like that. And you know, it helps us make decisions in the directions that we choose. I mean, we have a pretty good idea where we want to go. Um, generally, the survey is. I hesitate to say external validation, but generally, like last year's survey, I mean, mm -hmm. um, the responses were more ultralight 10 options, and that was the direction we were heading at, at the time anyway. So and you did it. Yeah, we did so. it. Yeah, you did it in style. Uh, so what about the uh, the Facebook group? What's it called? It's just uh, Seek Outside Adventures. Seek Outside Adventures. Yep. And I could go on there, and I could ask questions, and the whole community will join in and kind of- totally. Yeah, yeah. The, you'd be surprised how many responses. Some people get on there like, I'm torn. Should I get a six-man or a red cliff? And you'll see like 30 responses the next day from people yeah. discussing and mm -hmm. giving their... A lot of people in there that have our gear, that have used our gear for a long time, right? So yeah. they're, they're like, hey, man, no, this, this is, is this what, what I do. This is how it works. This is, yeah. They're, they're cool. really excited about it. So Sweet. Um, find us on Instagram, too. That's yeah. right. Put up stuff all the time. So. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Cool. Thanks. Folks, thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty.